Welcome to season two of True and Scary. New true and scary stories from around the world. With your host Joseph. Our feature subject this season will be serial killers. Hang tight after this short break we will kick off this exciting new season. True and Scary. This is season two of True and Scary. As of now you can hear us on Amazon Music. True and Scary your host. Joseph. Remember to like and subscribe. Hello friends and welcome to another episode of True and Scary. I am your host, Joseph. Let's dive right in there. Dorothy Jane Scott. Early in 1980, Dorothy Jane Scott began receiving the threatening phone calls at work. She was the single mother of a toddler who didn't think much of the calls at first until one night when the sinister voice over the phone told her to look outside. A single dead rose was outside, laying on the windshield of her car. The stalker who had gotten a hold of her number would oscillate between professing his love for her and threatening bodily harm. Dorothy mentioned to several family members and friends that the voice over the phone sounded familiar but she couldn't quite place who he was. She never did a chance to find out. One night at a staff meeting, Dorothy noticed one of her co-workers looked ill. She and another colleague drove the man to a nearby hospital. The doctor said he had a nasty spider bite and needed a prescription. While the two co-workers were waiting for the prescription to be filled, Dorothy went out to the parking lot to get to her car. It was the last time she was seen alive. The co-workers testified that after she did not return, they went out in the parking lot. At that moment, they saw her car speeding away, so they assumed there was an emergency with her son. Dorothy never returned home to her son, nor did anyone hear from her again. Four years later, her charred bones were found at the construction site, adding another layer of mystery to the case and the fact that a set of dog bones was found right next to her remains. So, people on the internet are still discussing the case today. No one was ever convicted or held in suspicion and the mysterious caller was never found. Quick break, we'll be right back. True and scary, I am Joseph. Please come back, if you will. See you soon, right about now. True and scary, your host is Joseph. Thank you for continuing your listening support. I am forever grateful for the fans. Please be sure to hit the like button and subscribe button. With that, it will keep me on the air and I will ever be grateful for that. And we'll try to get you more true and scary story locally and from around the world. Okay, see how quick that was? I'm Joseph and we are back here on True and Scary. The Chicago Tylenol Murder In September of 1982, a 12-year-old girl in Chicago passed away shortly after ingesting an extra strength Tylenol. That same day, a man died in a hospital after taking the same pill. Two of his family members followed. Over the course of the next few weeks, more seemingly healthy people in Chicago dropped dead. And the only thing they had in common was taking extra strength Tylenol shortly before the untimely death. As bottles were recalled by Johnson & Johnson, it was discovered that many of the extra strength Tylenol pills had been laced with potassium cyanide. Once this was made public, Johnson & Johnson issued numerous ads and warnings to customers to avoid the product. The company began working fervently on a triple-sealed package that would prevent tempering. 
James William Lewis of New York City contacted Johnson and Johnson, claiming that he was responsible for tampering with the bottles and filling the capsules with cyanide. He demanded one million dollars in exchange for him to stop. He was arrested for the crime, and although he wasn't found guilty, he was still in prison for extortion. Even after Johnson and Johnson fortified their Tylenol bottles against tampering, the widespread news of what had happened in Chicago prompted crimes of a similar nature all around the country. Several more people died from cyanide poison found in other over-the-counter medication. The Chicago Tylenol murders is one of the few true crime stories to spark real change in the country. The quality control of pharmaceuticals increased and tenfold, as did the security of their packaging. Although the FBI didn't have enough evidence to convict anyone of crime, it is widely believed that James William Lewis and his wife were indeed responsible. Tell me what you think about these stories. I want to hear your opinion. What would you have done in this situation? Contact us here at True and Scary Joseph. Let me know what you think. Or you can email us and leave some comments there. Or visit our YouTube page. You can also find us on Spreaker.com, True and Scary. We'll be right back after this. I'm Joseph, your host. Please come back and join us, will you? This is True and Scary. I am Joseph. The Girl Scout Murder. In the summer of 1977, three young Girl Scouts staying at the Oklahoma campsite were raped and murdered. The girls, Lori, Michelle, and Doris, were between the ages of 8 and 10. About two months before the murders, a camp counselor found a disturbing note in her belongings. The culprit promised to murder three children at the camp. Knowing that young campers enjoy telling scary stories around the campfire, the camp counselor dismissed the threatening note as nothing more than a prank, a decision she would come to regret. Early in the morning of June 13th, the girls' bodies were found in their sleeping bags out on the trail leading to the camp shower. The only evidence that their killer left behind was a red flashlight and a bloody footprint. The prime suspect in the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders was Jean Leroy Hart, an escaped convict. Hart had been raised about a mile from Camp Scott, and at the time of the murder, he was at large after escaping from prison, where he had been serving time for burglary, kidnapping, and rape. A local jury acquitted Hart of the crime. Citing a lack of evidence, however, Oklahoma police considered the case solved. To this day, no one knows if Jean Leroy Hart got away with murder, or if the true killer was someone else entirely. Either way, the girl's killer never saw justice. True and scary, I am Joseph. We have one more here for you. The Unicorn Killer As an adolescent, Ara Einhorn gave himself the nickname of The Unicorn, the English translation of his German surname. The killer was on an environmental activist and part of the anti-war movement when he murdered his ex-girlfriend, Holly Maddox. Maddox disappeared in early September of 1977 after stopping by and Horn's Philadelphia apartment to collect her things following their breakup. Several weeks after Maddox's death, police questioned her ex-boyfriend about her whereabouts, to which he stated she had disappeared on the way to the neighborhood co-op. Eighteen months later, 
After neighbors began reporting a rancid smell, police found Maddox's body stuffed in a trunk in Enhorn's closet. Several days before Enhorn was supposed to stand trial, he fled to Europe. As Enhorn had already been arranged, the court was able to try to convict and sentence him and abstain at abstain abstainia. <laughs> That's probably not the right pronouncing. I'm a little tired. <laughs> Continue. Despite this fact, Enhorn managed to remain in France in, for 23 years, even getting married while crafty evading extra extradition. The U.S. government was finally able to bring him back to the states, and he, he was reconvicted in 2002. Einhorn is now serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole. I think we actually have time for one more. Here we are. Is this it? Segwa. This cannibal became a local celebrity after. Finding himself out of a Japanese mental institution in 1986, Estelle Segwa came from a wealthy family and had ex exhibited cannibalistic urges from an early age, even engaging in bestiality. At 23, he made his first attempt at eating human flesh, breaking into a woman's house to cut off some of her flesh. He was caught and charged with attempted rape. Later, he would move to France to earn his PhD in literature. It would be then, at the age of 32, that Sagawa would kill and eat his classmate Rene Hardevelt. He admitted to luring the 25-year-old Dutch woman to his apartment under the guise of working on poetry. He said he chose her for her beauty and health. Two things he believed he lacked. After shooting her in the neck, he ate various parts of her body over the course of two. He then attempted to dump her body, including two suitcases of her dismembered body parts, into a lake in the Bois de Belonga, but was caught in the act. After being held for two years in police custody, Sagawa was deemed illegally insane in France. Court and was ordered to be held indefinitely in a mental institution. After being deported to Japan, he was declared sane by Japanese psychologist, psych, psychologist, and so was able to find himself out of care. That's it for today, friends. Glad you could be with us here today on Truth and Theory. If those stories were. Scary to you, or made you think, or made you a little bit more afraid? I want you to comment. Let me know. Contact us here at True and Scary. I'm Joseph. I want to hear from you. Until next time, don't be so scared.